The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Tuesday the 10th, 30 minutes to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe? Let me tell you, German investor confidence cratering. The ZEW index falling sharply as growing risks from COVID to supply shortages worrying investors. Despite this, Goldman Sachs sharply upgrading its forecast for European stocks. We're going to hear from GS's Sharon Bell very shortly. The EU won't reinstate travel restrictions on American tourists despite the US COVID surge. We're going to get the latest on Italy, from Italy on that story. And we await confirmation that Lionel Messi is moving to PSG. Paris Saint-Germain exiting Barcelona after more than 20 years of the new camp. Let's check on the markets. We'll get to the football later. This is the picture right now. European stocks up by three tenths of 1%. 472. We're climbing out of the recent range. Remember, 450, 460. We kind of moved out of that. We've come up to 470. We're continuing to climb ever higher. The euro, though, kind of feels stuck in a range at the moment. 117.19. We're down by around one, uh, one tenth of uh, 1%. The dollar certainly on the front foot, Alex. Yeah, it is, but it does feel like we're kind of range bound. At least we get that CPI uh, tomorrow at 8:30. The question: Are we seeing higher inflation actually eat into any any kind of demand? And that will be key for the follow through. We did see that in the NFIB when it comes to small businesses, uh, and you're seeing somewhat of a reaction. At one point, the dollar was a little bit stronger here, but now flat on the day. The commodity index getting a nice boost after getting really hammered yesterday. That's part of the dollar story. What I'm going to be watching tomorrow, though, break evens, and this is the two-year break even. It had been outperforming the as the market expected short-term inflation versus longer-term inflation. Now you have yields up by about three basis points here, but it did roll over quite a bit uh, over the last week or so. So watch that space, particularly if you see higher prices tomorrow and the break-evens don't move. That also is going to tell you something about some longer-term growth and longer-term inflation expectations as well. Maybe they stay relatively anchored, Guy. We'll have to see. Absolutely. Let's get back to that top story. Investor confidence in Germany's recovery dropping to its lowest level since late last year. Concerns over rising infection rates, return to pandemic curbs, what is happening in the supply chain, all weighing on optimism. Not so, though, for Goldman Sachs. Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs, global investment research equity strategist, joining us now. Goldman Sachs upgrading its forecasts for the stock 600. It sees a significant updraft in terms of the valuations that we can see. Earnings have been good, Sharon, yet the market hasn't kept up, as a result of which the P and the E look slightly out of whack. Walk us through your thinking, because others have started to grow a little bit concerned. Yeah, so, I mean, markets have been excellent this year. Um, I mean, in total return terms, Europe's up about 20%. Um, the broad stock 600 index you mentioned there before is up about 20% year to date, if you include dividends. So it's been fantastic return. It's kept pace with the S&P 500, done better than the NASDAQ, done better than um, emerging markets, et cetera. But you're right, earnings have done even better. So earnings revisions have been super positive. The first and second quarter earnings seasons were very good. So in fact, valuations have come down even as prices have gone up. And I think that is a little bit because people are worried about some of this data turning over. So, Sharon, I guess where's the biggest misprice with that? Because at European stocks at record highs, it's hard to know then where the best bang for your buck on that thesis is. Yeah, uh, look, I think that European stocks can go higher. Um, yes, they are at a record high, but they only recently in the last few months beat their highs from 2000 and 2007. It's not like the S&P 500 that has, has made continuous new highs for a decade or so. Um, Europe is at new highs. I do think that it can continue to perform quite well. We're looking for sort of 10% or so price return over this next year. That's slower than we've had in the last six months. Um, I think the best bang for your buck, probably in these value areas that people all hate. Um, <laughs> so banks, energy, mining companies, the things that investors have really um, been unsure of in the last few months. In terms of your targets, you've got 3, 6, 12, 480, 500, 520 in terms of the targets. Sharon, then what? So, um, I mean, I think at that point, it will very much depend on where we are in the rate cycle, where we are in terms of GDP. I mean, we are looking at European earnings growing on average from 2023 onwards by about 4% a year. Um, so that's reasonably good earnings growth. Bear in mind that 
last cycle, the average level of earnings growth through the 11 years from 2007 to 2018 um, was zero in Europe. Um, so if we're right, mm -hmm. Europe can grow at sort of four or five percent um, dividends and earnings growth with a little bit of dividend yield as well, because European companies pay good income. So maybe two or three percent dividend yield then that should give investors a reasonable return even in the longer term. So beyond that 10%, I'd still be expecting 7 or 8% per year around the cost of equity. Um, what happens to margins and such in 2022 20, uh, as well? You have uh, earnings slowing a touch, although obviously still enormously elevated. Uh, what about on the margin side? Yeah, uh, margins, I, this is a super good question. I, I think margins, this is your risk, because actually one of the reasons, or the sole reason really, that the second quarter earnings season was so good is that margins um, were revised up. And if you remember two, three months ago, the number one question everyone was asking is input costs. What will happen with all this rising raw material costs? What will happen with the problems in supply? What will happen um, uh, with costs, basically? And will companies be able to pass that on? The truth is they have been able to pass it on. Um, but beyond this year, I think they may struggle a little bit more. Um, and we have margins kind of flat from 2022 onwards. The consensus, if you add up all the bottom-up numbers from analysts, has them continuing to rise. But, you know, your previous article talked about wage growth. That's a risk. Taxation rising, that's a risk. Input costs going up, that's a risk as well. So I feel that's why I would be a bit more muted in the outer years on my earnings forecast. If I'm a U.S. investor and I'm looking at Europe, do I need to hedge the currency risk? We were talking about this a little bit earlier on. We're kind of 117 right now. Um, we are going to see a taper in the United States. We are probably going to see rate hikes in the United States before we're going to see them, well before we're going to see them in the Eurozone. What impact is that going to have? So it's a balance of things. I think you're likely, absolutely, I mean, Europe isn't likely to tighten policy anytime soon. So tightening policy would tend to push up the dollar, all other things being equal, because you're getting higher yields on US assets. Um, but all of the things aren't necessarily equal. It will really depend on whether we get through this Delta variant in a manageable way globally. If we do and we start seeing growth expectations improve and things like the ZEW survey going back up again, if that happens, global growth improves, Europe is much higher beta to that, much more sensitive to that because it's got all the big exporters in places like Germany. And that would all other things equal push up the euro. We expect the euro to rise a little bit. So probably not actually. I don't see a huge reason to hedge. Um, but, you know, for clients that see it as risky, I think that you'll make reasonable returns and on a hedge basis as well in European equity. Um, bear with me while I sort of frame this question. Uh, Angela Merkel uh, just was talking and then in, in a press conference in Berlin saying that uh, German immunization rate has slowed considerably. We're seeing something here in the U.S. The distinction it feels is that here in the U.S., the vaccination issue is so politicized um, in a way that feels different than any issues that remain in Europe. And I wonder if you pair that with the Delta variant, I wonder what that does to the U.S. exceptionalism story and then what that does to the let's go bet on recovery story with Europe. Can, mm -hmm. we walk you, can we walk me through kind of your thinking if you put those two things together? So ultimately, we do think the Delta variant will prove manageable for developed markets because we do think that vaccination, particularly of the most vulnerable age groups, has been very good in both the US and Europe. Um, now, of course, it would be great if there were higher rates of vaccination and that were continuing. I mean, we found in the US, for example, that the states where you are seeing most increase in the virus, you are starting to see a pickup in people wanting vaccinations. Um, so perhaps the Delta variant will trigger more desire to get yourself vaccinated um, by more reluctant um, individuals for vaccination. So I think that would be helpful. But so far, hospitalizations, although they certainly picked up and fatalities have picked up in places like the UK where the Delta variant has been prevalent, um, they're still much lower than they were at the peak of the last wave in the early part of this year. So we feel it will be manageable. Um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons that market valuation has come down a bit. Um, all right, Sharon, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Sharon Bell of Goldman Sachs. Thank you. And just sort of on that point and sort of highlights the idea of a stay-at-home recovery potentially, Citigroup is now telling employees returning to offices in New York area and other big U.S. cities that they'll need to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, the bank had also told employees that, uh, that um, they're going to return to the office September 13th, but they have to be vaccinated. And any kind of staffers have to wear masks uh, in all offices and branch uh, regardless 
of whether or not uh, they have shots. Guy, this is going to be a theme and a theme that we're hearing again and again. Yeah, companies are definitely becoming more cautious. Wall Street is becoming much more cautious in terms of its attitude towards this. It's interesting that even the vaccinated still are going to be required mm -hmm. to wear face masks. So it's a kind of double layer of cautiousness uh, that these companies are, are putting into place. Um, it, it, it again, we, I, I, you've been bringing this up. We still don't know, and we're going to talk about this next, what kind of recovery mm -hmm. we're going to see. The, the elongated phase of the working from home is only going to encourage more and more people to want to do it and stick with it. And it's going to change the labor market maybe in a much more permanent way than we originally anticipated. We're also getting some details coming through from Boeing in terms of its, uh, its orders and deliveries. Uh, 630 gross orders, 270 net sales year to date. Uh, it has reported 31 gross orders for July, delivered 28 jets. Uh, it, in some ways, it's playing a catch up at the moment. It is outpacing Airbus, definitely. Airbus is in a delivery mode, cash flow generation kind of mode right now. Uh, and Boeing is playing catch up. It's had problems with the 737 MAX. We know that. It's had problems with the Dreamliner. It's trying to put those in the rear view mirror and generate some orders. But it needs to also generate cash flow. The deliveries are really important in terms of what you look at when you see these numbers because that's when the money ultimately really flows down to the uh, to the uh, into the middle of the balance sheet um we'll talk more about that story certainly over the next few days got a big jet blue event coming up midweek uh for airbus uh but let's get back to the story that alex was talking about the return to the office recovery i we talked about it a few months ago we thought it was going to happen because we've just been hearing city requiring vaccinations for employees returning to the office how is this going to impact the economic trajectory? We'll try and get an answer to that question. Stephen King, HSBC Senior Economic Advisor, joining us next. This is Bloomberg. We came back to a hybrid environment after uh, the 4th of July. Now we've kind of gone back to working primarily from home. A hybrid way of working is, is here to stay. Our offices are revolving into more hybrid spaces, more flexible working. We're prepared to have the flexibility to allow people to work from home two to three days a week. We're not yet in a position where we're going to be pushing and encouraging uh, more, at, you know, more in-office uh, work. We'll just have to take it day by day, week by week. Just saying two and a half days, well, that's a simple thing to say, but you have to make sure that the teams can have a catch up. The new Apollo. Um, you know, I think flexibility is the name of the game. Uh, when it comes for us and our business, I think that we've really preached the mantra of flexibility. Those are various executives on Bloomberg TV speaking about the return to office plans. And just a few moments ago, Citigroup says that all employees returning to the office will need to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Joining us uh, with his thoughts on what that does to the economic recovery is Stephen King, HSBC Senior Economic Advisor, joins us from London. Stephen, I've been talking about it for a couple of weeks, that idea of a stay-at-home recovery. It's a very different recovery than the one we would have been talking about six weeks ago. How does that change your economic calculus? Well, as you can tell, I'm definitely working from home because my office does not look uh, quite like this. In fact, I went back to the office for the first time in, in months uh, last Wednesday, just to remind myself of what the office looked like. Um, I, I think this is something where time will determine whether this is a, a really a long-term story or not, um, to the extent that clearly companies themselves have to look out for the health of their employees, um, worries about perhaps commuting to work each morning, uh, crowded um, tube trains, metros, whatever, all those kinds of things are relevant. There's also an issue about whether people are all at work on the same day in the same place, but if you're not arriving on the same day, the value of being in work begins to go down to a significant degree. But I think also companies have to look out for particularly their younger workers. Uh, if you're a graduate trainee joining a company and you're working from home, you know, who do you speak with? Uh, where do you learn to do the job from? Uh, you know, all these things become quite tricky and might uh, have some implications for productivity longer term. So I think there's a whole bunch of experimental things going on currently, which are inevitable yep. given the nature of the pandemic, but they don't necessarily prove we're going to massively change things over the next four or five years, let's say. Stephen, how does it affect the supply side of the economy? How does it ultimately affect the labour market? Because that's where the gaps are at the moment. Um, it may be less with office jobs, but certainly in other areas of the economy, people are less keen to come back. Uh, therefore, we have big gaps. We certainly have big gaps when it comes to skilled labour. 
does what is happening now change the dynamic as to how we expect the supply side of the economy to come back, how the labor market to balance? So I think one thing here is actually the openness of borders, frankly, um, and the UK probably is an extreme example of this, frankly. Uh, but given Brexit alongside the pandemic, uh, you've got an awful lot of people who were working in the UK who've gone back home, whether the home happens to be France, Germany, Italy or Spain or, or somewhere else. And they're not quite so keen to come back, uh, partly because of the uncertainties of crossing borders, which are much greater than they used to be. Um, and one consequence of that is that you've got this sort of strange combination currently of people wanting to have staycations, having holidays at home. But at the same time, the workers that would actually support those staycations mm -hmm. simply aren't there. So you've got some very strange things going on whereby labor markets are not working in the way that they might have done in the past. So, Stephen, on the flip side in terms of the labor market, there's also a different dynamic, which is how workers are going to bargain for stuff. So we're all waiting for wages to increase. We've clearly seen that with junior bankers, right, with all the big banks. But there also seems to be a narrative that they're going to argue for things like, I won't take a pay increase, but I'll work at home for four days. How does that ch But it doesn't mean the economy isn't growing. It's just going to be different. And the feed through into wages and inflation will then be different. How, do you th how are you thinking about it? Uh, well, this is, this is tricky. There are so many moving parts here that I don't think anyone as yet has the full answer. I think a lot depends, frankly, not so much on what happens with wages, but rather what happens with productivity. In other words, if you're working from home, are you more or less productive than you would have been if you're working um, in the office? Um, and some people we know have been more productive working uh, from home, less in the way of disturbances, less in the way of perhaps pointless meetings that tend to happen in the office. Uh, but others perhaps have struggled because you know some offices work on the basis of the connections between the different employees. If the connections are not quite so easy to make, you're likely to end up uh, with some kind of reduction in productivity. So I think a lot of this depends on the efficiency with which people are working, what sort of output they're producing when they're at home rather than the, when they're at work. I appreciate what you're saying about productivity, but nevertheless, central banks are watching very carefully to see what happens with second round effects. Are we going to see wages starting to follow other areas where we are seeing inflation? And some of those may be transitory. We, we simply don't know. But nevertheless, the second round effects appears to be where central banks are focusing their attention. Will this new labor market, to Alex's point, produce easy to understand evidence of what is happening mm. that will give those central banks the clues they need to make accurate decisions? Frankly, I think it will not be straightforward. I think central bankers, like the rest of us, are facing much higher levels of uncertainty than they would normally be faced with because we don't often live through a pandemic and then come out the other side. What I think is true, though, is that there are certainly pockets where wages are rising more quickly than they would have done in the past. This again comes back to the, the openness or lack of openness of borders. If people could move across borders very easily in the past and they can no longer do so, then you may end up in a situation where the people who should be ideally in country A are stranded in country B. Mm. And as a consequence of that, they're not actually adding to the labor market and to resources in country A. And one potential consequence of that is that wages in country A will be bid up higher than would otherwise be the case. So this may mean that some countries are more prone to wage inflation than others, which in turn may mean that some central banks have a very different experience of inflation mm -hmm. than might be true elsewhere in the world. Well, well that, I don't want to open a can of worms here, but does that decrease or increase the risk of a central bank having a policy mistake? Oh, I think the risk of policy mistakes has gone up significantly. It's not because central banks intend to make policy mistakes. That obviously would never be the case. It's rather that the uncertainty that we're faced with is much higher than would normally be the case. You can form one sort of scenario that says you know, wages and prices are going to accelerate quite strongly over the course of the next few months um, and take the view you have to you know, uh, adjust monetary policy aggressively in those circumstances. Another scenario would be to say, well, this is just a, a series of near-term supply-side shocks that will unwind as the pandemic itself begins to evolve or possibly comes to an end, and therefore the inflation will prove to be very short-lived. Now, those are two perfectly reasonable scenarios, but they have very, very different <laughs> implications in terms of monetary policy. Stephen, we're going to leave it there. Interesting stuff. Stephen King of HSBC. Talking of Labour moving from <laughs> country A to country B, let's talk about Lionel Messi. <laughs> he, he's going from Barcelona, we think, to PSG in Paris. New Camp to the Parc de Prince.
I, I haven't actually had this confirmed yet. There's obviously a lot of evidence, but a hugely emotional event for him. He's been there since he was 13, 20 years. What impact is it going to have, A, in Spain and B, in France? We're going to be talking about that next, Alex. Uh, that was amazing. You went through the whole thing without making fun of me because uh, I had to have a little tutorial there uh, on football. Okay, um, also, as we had to break, uh, we're taking a look at the Senate floor. It's a live shot where senators are making their final vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. We're going to monitor that, bring you the results when the voting is done. Then the budget resolution and voterama takes place. This is Bloomberg. So let's talk about football. Football, the game you play with your feet. Argentinian soccer star Lionel Messi uh, has reached an agreement, we now think, to join the French club, Paris Saint-Germain, PSG. I think we're waiting uh, for details on exactly what the medical says, but I'm sure that'll be fine. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo is here with more. Maria, you've been following this kind of tick by tick. I guess a Spaniard, I guess you've got to. Um, <laughs> he's going, hugely kind of consequential event, not only for him, but for the clubs involved as well. PSG, though, I have to ask, why is he going to PSG? I, this is a club that looks like it's built for the Champions League, not for the French League. You know, guy, 100%, you know, I 200% agree with you on that. You know, I think uh, on the one hand, you know, it's a question of money. Of course, he's walking away with 35 million euros on an annual basis. Uh, just to give you some details, he's signing on for two years and potentially extended to a third season. Of course, this is a team that is also glamorous as Paris and, you know, he's going to go back and be reunited with his best friend, Neymar. But what I think is interesting, guy, here, it's not so much Messi now, but it's really the impact that this has on the Spanish league. You know, when you look at the big names, Ronaldo, Sergio Ramos, now Messi, all of them have actually left the Spanish league. And it brings up a good question. Who is going to watch this? And what kind of domino effect are we going to get on everything from the TV rights to the sponsors who may want to see real star quality and they're not getting it anymore? Are we able to nail down at this point why this has happened? Is this, is this something that's happened because of the league, the way that the league is looking at the wage bill? I, clearly, he wanted to stay. You look at, look at the man. He wanted to stay there. Like in 10 seconds, who's to blame? Well, you know, Guy, it's a lot. You know, it's, it's the transfer fees. It's the fact that Barcelona did not manage to sell the players that they wanted to get in there. So in the end, it was all about the balance sheet. It just was too much, too expensive. Maria, thank you very much indeed. European closes next. This is Bloomberg. We're wrapping up the Tuesday session here in Europe. This is what the markets look like. Um, the, the European close is approaching rapidly. We're up again, 472. We're up by three-tenths of 1%, as you can see, just fading off the earlier highs. But nevertheless, European stocks continuing to plough ever forward days, weeks, months since we had, since we had a significant correction. Uh, in terms of what is happening with the other asset classes, it's worth paying attention to. Clearly, what we saw yesterday in terms of the, uh, the energy sector, uh, a huge factor. Uh, today, we are seeing energy coming back a little bit. That's certainly something to watch out for. Uh, so Brent's up by 2.68%. Gold continuing the fade. Euro dollar continuing to track lower, 117.21. We're coming up to some key levels uh, on the dollar index. So just pay attention to that. CPI tomorrow could be a really big number, could move the dollar. Uh, so we could see a little bit of volatility over the next few days. In terms of the individual markets, the FTSE, DAX and the CAC, clearly we're in the middle of summer. But nevertheless, we are seeing some in interesting price action. Uh, the FTSE, the DAX and the CAC all climbing today. The FTSE 100 up by four tenths of one percent. The energy names coming back. The CAC Caron uh, up by two tenths as was the DAX. The, the luxury sector continues to go from strength to strength. Uh, record highs once again in through the luxury sector. I'll show you LVMH in just a moment. In terms of the sector rotation, what are we seeing? Let's work our way through what we're getting here. Uh, we talk about travel and leisure as if it's kind of a ubiquitous sector. It's really not. Um, that is where we're seeing the strength today. But it's mainly the betting companies that are actually doing well. I'll talk about Flutter in just, just a moment. Uh, the basic resources, the miners are bouncing back. The insurance sector's up, so they're all doing quite well. Where's energy? Energy 
tracking up by around half of 1%. Down at the bottom, kind of a flip of yesterday. So the more defensive ends of the market, healthcare, real estate, the car sector is giving a little bit of weakness as well, but the, the real weakness in the healthcare sector. So let's talk about the individual stocks. Flutter out with some really strong numbers today. This is a betting company. The stock really being rewarded uh, on the back of that. Good guidance. The market really liking what it's hearing. LVMH, another record. It's just kind of worth noting every once in a while what is happening here. Some of these huge names in Europe continuing to go from strength to strength. IHG, though, Intercontinental Hotels. I, good numbers. China's looking all right. The United States is looking strong. The market, I think, probably had already priced in a lot of this good news uh, as a result of that. So IHG today kind of flatlining. It was down a little bit more earlier, but finishing the day, Alex, down by three-tenths of 1%. Yep, exactly. Good numbers. And even more interestingly, the EU decided not to reinstate restrictions on travel from the U.S. And travel companies are eagerly welcoming back the desperate travelers after a year of being cooped indoors. People are desperate to travel. I mean, there is that demand and that hunger we see. There is a big appetite to travel. So everywhere where people can travel, we see immediately bookings coming in. Cruise demand is strong among our guests who are thrilled to be back. We are seeing people obviously much more comfortable to be in uh, hotels, resorts, all, all the usual lodging use, use cases. We see actually an increase of demand probably in the future for leisure business demand. We will see cases in the cruise industry, but we have among the best uh, protections in the larger leisure business. While the variant is out there um, overall, you know, we're, we're seeing bookings and we're seeing the experience accelerate. I think we'll continue to see that. I don't see Delta having a, a particularly large impact on it. Right, let's get a deeper dive here. Joining us now is Giancarlo Carniani, uh, to Florence Hotel's general manager. Giancarlo, thank you for joining us. Give us some perspective. Who is traveling right now, and what happens in September when all the kids go back to school? Uh, well, traveling right now is still uh, much here in Italy domestic, and uh, of course, the people from Europe, which are still traveling with their own car. So they're trying again uh, for another year to avoid traveling with the train uh, and plane if they can. Uh, but situation, uh, it's uh, getting on much back to, to, to normal, especially on the seaside and on the mountains. Uh, the art city are still um, suffering because, of course, international travel is coming back very slowly. We see some sign in uh, late fall, end of September, October, uh, for um, Americans coming back to, to Europe. Have you seen, John Collar, it's Guy, um, have you seen many Americans, because there was this sense, certainly, that, that because Americans are allowed to travel Europe, we're not allowed to go the other way, that many Americans were taking advantage of that. Is that what you've seen? I'm curious to know, kind of relative to what normal experience would be, how many American travelers are you seeing? Uh, well, it's quite curious that, that we, they, they can come to Europe, while still we, we cannot come to the, U, the US. But uh, I've seen, I have the same sensation. I have seen uh, uh, a, a, a lot of, of people which they are, they are asking for, for, for traveling. They would come immediately if, if they can. Uh, what we see, it's um, a few couples, uh, tours, that a few tours are coming back. So people is trying to avoid to travel with the children because now the situation is not yet exactly what you expect in order to know what will happen if you get COVID while you are in Europe. Uh, situation, it's really, with the Green Pass here, is now, is now really quiet, and we, we hopefully uh, coming back to normally in, in a few months, we need to. Um, when I spoke with some uh, tour operators from the U.S. and some regions from the U.S., they told me that the, 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 the idea to, to, come, to come back to travel is so strong that they, they will be ready to travel off-season. Mm -hmm. So we really hope so. I just want to point out some breaking news. You're looking at a live shot there of the U.S. He uh, Senate floor. Uh, the Senate now has enough votes to pass the $550 billion bipartisan infrastructure plan that was expected. That vote is currently ongoing, uh, but we do have enough votes to pass uh, that infrastructure bill. Uh, Giancarlo, uh, give us some perspective of until that demand truly comes back, is more state aid being needed? Uh, yes, here in Italy we are asking uh, more state aid uh, uh, 
until uh, the end of the year. Um, probably we'll, we'll, we will ask also for the beginning of 2022. What we see, it's a lot of people now booking for 2022. Hopefully um, everything will be fine for, for that date. But yes, for, for labor and uh, for uh, the situation of most of the hotels, especially as I was saying, in the art cities, in big city, Milan, Rome, Florence, we, we need a state aid um, for a few months again. Yeah. Giancarlo, what do you think the winter season is going to look like? I, are we going to be skiing? Are the resorts that, that have had such a tough time over the last few years going to be up and running? Can they sustain another winter when people aren't skiing? No, I don't think they will sustain another, another winter with people not skiing. And I'm quite confident that this year people will, will be able to ski. Um, I don't have any feeling that there will be another big closure um, and, unless uh, the, the something happened with the variants. But uh, I, I think the situation now is, is looking, I mean, um, it's looking quiet. With the, when, when the government decided to introduce also the obligation of the Green Pass to, to enter restaurants and so on, we have a very big peak of people who get vaccinated and get the green pass at the very last moment. So um, we need to do that. And uh, I don't think there will be any other uh, closure like we have experienced in the past three years. Giancarlo, we're going to leave you there. I hope you're right. Giancarlo Cani joining us from two Florence hotels. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Alex, so we're yes. getting the vote. We've got the we've got the numbers. The vote is obviously continuing, but it looks like we've got the numbers. But this is I, this is just the first step, isn't it? Well, yes. Like, I mean, we need uh, to get. It. Go ahead. Well, it, it needs to obviously now go to the house. It looks like it's going to be complicated there. Then we're going to get on to the second phase of all of this. I, this is just the opening gambit in some ways. Right, and the progressive uh, wing of the Democrats in the House are, are going to pose some potential problems with this because the $550 billion in new spending isn't necessarily uh, what they wanted. And also Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, will not be taking up a vote uh, of this until the, se the Senate actually passes the human infrastructure bill which is what we're going to be looking at later with the budget resolution and the voterama. So it's a complicated process, but nonetheless, let's not diminish the fact that there was something bipartisan uh, that was passed that introduced new money uh, to spend on infrastructure. Uh, joining us now on Capitol Hill is Bloomberg's uh, Anne-Marie Hordern, who is standing by for this vote. Anne-Marie, the significance of what's passed, what's going to be in it, and then what we expect next. Well, what's in it is everything we've been talking about for weeks, if not months. This is hard infrastructure, everything from fixing potholes to airports to bridges. Um, what's significant about this vote, it now has a number of votes in order to pass, even though it is ongoing. We should note Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell did vote yes on this vote. Um, also interesting, not sure quite where he stands in the vote yet, but Senator Lindsey Graham is back at the Capitol and he came for this vote, but he was for this infrastructure. He was part of that bipartisan group, so likely that's going to be a yes. But I did take a walk over uh, to the Capitol from where I stand in one of the Senate buildings with Senator Rick Scott of uh, Florida. And he said he's voting no on this just because, one, it doesn't clear the CBO pay for in terms of a quarter trillion dollars that they say is not paid for. And also kind of out of protest is the sense I got for the fact that right after this, we are moving to budget resolution, which is the framework for that $3.5 trillion reconciliation package, that soft infrastructure that includes everything from um, K through starting a child, uh, start starting schooling for all universal at the age, the K age, I think that's three years old, including also two years of free community college, Medicare ben benefits, uh, Medicare benefits, as well as climate change initiatives. So that is going to be where we're going to see a voterama, and potentially that can take hours. I will say, though, this is symbolic, and it is a symbolic win for the White House. In terms of what comes next, I, what is your sense? Is, how, how dug in is everybody? What are the expectations? Clearly, this is going to be something that the Democrats have to do on their own. Kind of how divided are they? When are we going to start getting clarity on the shape and the form of this next leg is going to look like? 
Well, two things here. One is that we could potentially see the House get called back in, even though they're on recess to take up these measures. As Alex said, Speaker Pelosi has made it very clear she is only doing the bipartisan infrastructure deal if it comes with reconciliation. So the Senate needs to move on that uh, fairly quickly, but the House potentially can come back in uh, a little bit early to try to get things in the works. The thing I would say is that, yes, you hear a lot of the fact that there is quite a divide or between more moderate Democrats like Senator Joe Manchin, say, or Kirsten Sinema from Arizona, between those of the progressive left. But I don't think the Democrats are going to waste this moment. Would they squander a moment they have when they have control of both, both chambers and the White House to do something big? That's a question we need to be asking, our, asking ourselves. But yeah, there is going to be some very hard logistics when it comes down to that $3.5 trillion soft infrastructure package. The other sort of headwind here, aside from any progressive moves, is the Senate parliamentarian who, unelected, to still wields a ton of power and has the potential to say what can or cannot go for a vote in what particular bill. Um, what's the risk that they may rule that some of the provisions that we're looking at uh, in the human infrastructure bill that rely on budget reconciliation can't go through? And do you have a sense yet of sort of the wrinkle technically that this could pose? We don't have a sense yet of what exactly that's going to look like, Alex, the details just yet. Um, potentially in a few weeks, early September, I believe it's September 15th, they wanted to really roll out the details of that, frame, of, of that reconciliation bill. But right now, it's just the framework of that bill. And I would say another interesting point of that resolution, of that framework of the reconciliation bill, is the fact that the debt limit is not in there, which means the Democrats want a bipartisan approach when it comes to raising our debt ceiling. And we do know that September 30th, that's the end game in terms of the fiscal year for the U.S. government. How will Biden, how will the president play this? Is, is he in a position at this stage to kind of have a victory lap? Look, we're doing, doing something huge for the American people here without it in reality being done. Certainly, Guy, he will certainly say this is a huge victory. He will say that the day he walked out of the White House with five Republicans and five Democrats to get the framework of this bipartisan infrastructure agreement, that, look, the Senate is working and we were able to come to a bipartisan hard infrastructure agreement and the White House will tout this as a huge success. Remember, President Biden campaigned on the fact that he wants to make Washington quote unquote work again and bring bipartis bipartisanship back his first year of office. He's going to say he's doing it. Um, Anne Marie, it's a great point. And yes, in order to have that kind of victory lap uh, is huge as well. When do we also get some knowledge of the pay fors? Well, the papers right now, in terms of the bipartisan infrastructure agreement, we have the knowledge of, right? The CBO says that it's not exactly paid for. It. A quarter of a trillion dollars is, is still not paid for in this infrastructure package. But most senators say the CBO is looking at it a little bit too narrow. They're not taking into consideration the fact of macroeconomic things that could propel from this infrastructure agreement, meaning if you fix roads, then goods can travel faster. They're saying things that benefit the economy that are a bit more long-term and bird's eye view are not considered in that. So that's one, uh, that's one issue in terms of the pay fors. For the reconciliation bill, Alex, that is going to be higher taxes. That's how part of that is going to be paid for. And we are waiting to see from the Senate Finance Committee a menu of potential options of how they're going to raise taxes. We know that it's going to be corporate taxes that are getting raised. Remember, President Biden said he wants to move that to the highest being 28 percent. Potentially, some moderate Democrats are going to say that's a little bit too high. And then also wealthy individuals in America, although they said they, we, they will not raise taxes on anyone making less than $400,000 a year. AMH, don't go anywhere. We're going to get the final results in just a moment. We need to talk more about what is happening here. We'll be back to D.C. in just a moment as we continue to track what is happening on the Senate floor. Let's bring in Guy Berger, LinkedIn's principal economist, focusing on the labour market. Guy, thanks for your time today. Perfect moment to join. What impact do you think all of this money, all of this infrastructure spending, both in terms of the hard and the social infrastructure is actually going to have in terms of reshaping the U.S. labor market? Well, 
I think the first thing to, to remember is if, if you step back to where we were about a year ago, there was all this worry that we were in for a repeat of 2009 or the really long slog back to, to full employment. And in fact, what's happened is we've recovered tremendously fast. Um, you know, we look at our data and hiring, people starting jobs, that's up 38% over the past year, incredibly fast, faster than anybody expected at the time. Um, what this does is help continue that turbocharging so we can return back to full employment, maybe even go past where we were uh, before COVID in terms of a healthy labor market. I think it's, you know, potentially good news. Um, in terms of the types of jobs that can come out of this specifically, do we have a sense of like how quickly those jobs will come up what kind of wages they might pay. I'm obviously thinking more in the clean energy sense because of the different kind of jobs, but in general. Well, I think that you, you know, when we look at our data, one of the big things we notice is, is this great reshuffling. It's, it's actually pretty remarkable that um, given how fast labor markets heated up, um, people have been able to move from one industry to the other, change roles, you know, faster than a lot of people would have expected. You know, a lot of these bottlenecks and shortages that people talk about are part of those growing pains. Uh, people shifting from one place to the other. And I think this potentially layers a little bit more of that. I mean, if you're trying to, to hire green skills, certainly we've seen a lot of reskilling mm -hmm. in our data of people toward green skills and green jobs, but there's gonna be some, some catch up that needs to happen if this adds another layer of reshuffling on top of the great reshuffling we're already seeing. Out of curiosity, what are you seeing in terms of the impact that the re-emergence of COVID is having right now? The Delta variant, obviously, front and center. A lot of businesses that thought they'd be bringing staff back right now are having to be a little bit more flexible in their approach, put that, push that date back a bit. Can you just kind of overlay that on what you're saying in terms of the, uh, the bigger picture when it comes to the labor market? Yeah, so the first thing to actually remember is if you look at our data and look at what industries are really hot right now, and it's, it's actually an inversion of what it was last year. Um, hiring in recreation and travel, uh, which is a sector that's been hardest hit by COVID, is up 50% relative to the end of 2020. That's a lot. So despite challenging and bottlenecks that, that restaurants are experiencing and, and tourism are experiencing, they're still managing to put people in, in, in seats. Um, and so that's the, that's the good news. Now, in the short run, could the Delta variant impact the sector negatively in terms of people being a little more cautious, demand by customers going down a little bit, uh, workers being a little more cautious? Probably. But I think that, that given vaccination rates are as high as they are, it just seems likely this will have less of an impact uh, on the sector than prior waves. And I think might be a shorter impact as well. Um, Guy, as, as we look ahead to the CPI tomorrow, as well, and we're waiting for this uh, infrastructure bill uh, to officially uh, pass the Senate. Um, how do you anticipate wages pressuring overall inflation? We've been talking about this idea of a stay-at-home recovery, and if I want to get paid in things like I get to work from home versus actual cash, that sort of dilutes the typical data points that we'd look at and then the pass-through uh, to inflation. How do you model something like this right now? Well, I think there's there's really two forces. One is sort of these, these bottlenecks. We've already seen, you know, Three months ago, if I'd been on, we would have been all been talking about lumber prices. Lumber prices are back down. Used cars are really expensive. I think a lot of these labor issues look a lot like that. They're just an adjustment. Almost, you know, the, the Council of Economic Advisors described it as equivalent or similar to the U.S. demobilizing from the wars in, in the 40s and early 50s. And that's a lot of what this looks like. We, we will see how persistent, you know, the gr elevated growth in wages for lower paid workers is. If it remains persistent, then, you know, we could see the price of some of those services and goods go up. But, you know, I think I think like we really have, you know, it's really a question of not what things look like for the next four or five CPI prints or what they look like for inflation a year, two, three years down the line. All right, Guy, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being flexible with us as well. Guy Berger, LinkedIn uh, principal economist, thank you very much. So uh, you were looking at a live shot of the Senate. The voting is continuing. Uh, the Senate does have enough votes to pass the $550 billion infrastructure uh, bill. We're going to wait for the final vote count in just a moment. Um, for more insight, we're going to get to Bloomberg's Balance of Power anchor, uh, David Weston. David, thanks for getting in the seat early. What are you watching for on the vote? Well, I mean, we, the vote's over, effectively. They've got the votes that they needed, and uh, they got their bipartisan uh, package. I think the thing we're looking for right now are two things, Alex, one of which you've just been talking with Anne-Marie Hordern about, which is what comes next in the Senate, which is that huge $3.5 trillion budget uh, uh, proposal that they're going to have to decide, they're going to vote on for the next day or two. But the second thing, Alex, is the House of Representatives. We have to remember, we have a bicameral legislature. There's another House there. And the House hasn't yet said they're going to sign off on this.
Mm -hmm. David, in terms of what that means over the next few months, I, do, we, do we have a clear understanding, I guess we probably don't, of how this process is going to evolve? Um, we, we still don't know exactly what the House is going to be looking for. We know that the House wants both of them. Uh, we know that this is going to have to be run on a Democrat-only basis in the Senate. I, do, do, we get a, do, we, do we have a feel yet of, of what the ultimate shape of this second piece is going to look like? Well, a guy, as you know, this is Washington, and more than that, it's Capitol Hill. So to say we know what's going to happen would be fool foolish. Nobody knows what's going to happen. If we're going to guess, and maybe an educated guess, maybe not, first of all, on the House side, there'll probably be some tweaking. For example, they may come back to that cryptocurrency provision about reporting. They may try to tweak that on the House side. Uh, but they'll get that mm -hmm. through the House, I believe, so we will have an infrastructure package, something like this. And then, of course, the whole battle is over the budget, over the reconciliation, the $3.5 trillion, I, I'm guessing, again is not going to end up 3.5 trillion it's going to be less than that there's going to be a back a lot of back and forth but then we also have that pesky thing called the debt ceiling that they're going to have to rub up against and as we know thus far they've not put that in as part of the budget process it's separate as the democrats really put M mitch mcconnell on the spotlight to say are you really going to default the u.s government mm -hmm. Well, David, just to update everybody here, uh, it is officially passed. Uh, the $550 billion infrastructure bill does pass the U.S. Senate. Um, David, I, I have a hard time remembering what has been bipartisan with the exception of a relief bill in the beginning of COVID. I mean, I, I know that there are a lot of hurdles. It's not a done deal, particularly with the progressives uh, in the House. But yet a bipartisan spending with, you know, over $500 billion of new money is no small feat for a very partisan D.C., yeah, it, it, I, that's absolutely right, although there were actually three uh, fiscal stimulus bills that got through on a bipartisan basis under President Trump, I should say. The partisan one came up with the American Rescue Plan, which was actually President Biden at the beginning of this year. Also, don't forget Juneteenth. I mean, they passed a federal, uh, a new federal holiday uh, on a bipartisan basis, almost no one voting against it. So, and we talk a lot about the hyperpartisanship, and it certainly is there in Washington, but there are some things getting done that are bipartisan with Republicans and Democrats. David, voting for the money is great. Spending the money mm. actually probably end up, will be quite difficult, will end up being quite difficult. When you talk to politicians in D.C., how quickly do they think the effect of this is going to be? We'll, we'll pause that so uh, question. We've got breaking news. We need to go uh, and listen uh, to Governor Cuomo. He is making the first statement since the allegations were made. The report said I sexually harassed 11 women. That was the headline people heard and saw and reacted to. The reaction was outrage. It should have been. However, it was also false. My lawyers, as you just heard from Rita Glavin, have reviewed the report over the past several days and have already raised serious issues and flaws that should concern all New Yorkers. Because when there is a bias or a lack of fairness in the justice system, it is a concern for everyone, not just those immediately affected. The most serious allegations made against me had no credible factual basis in the report. And there is a difference between alleged improper conduct and concluding sexual harassment. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not to say that there are not 11 women who I truly offended. There are. And for that, I deeply, deeply apologize. I thought a hug and putting my arm around a staff person while taking a picture was friendly, but she found it to be too forward. I kissed a woman on the cheek at a wedding, and I thought I was being nice, but she felt that it was too aggressive. I have slipped and called people honey, sweetheart, and darling. I meant it to be endearing, but women found it dated and offensive. I said on national TV to a doctor wearing PPE and giving me a COVID nasal, nasal swab, you make that gown look good. I was joking. Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have said it on national TV, but she found it disrespectful. I take 
full responsibility for my actions. I have been too familiar with people. My sense of humor can be insensitive and off-putting. I do hug and kiss people casually, women and men. I have done it all my life. It's who I've been since I can remember. In my mind, I've never crossed the line with anyone. But I didn't realize the extent to which the line has been redrawn. There are generational and cultural shifts that I just didn't fully appreciate. And I should have. No excuses. The report did bring to light a matter that I was not aware of and that I would like to address. A female trooper relayed a concern that she found disturbing, and so do I. Please let me provide some context. The governor's trooper detail had about 65 troopers on it. But of the 65, only six women and nine black troopers. I'm very proud of the diversity of my administration. It's more diverse than any administration in history. And I'm very proud of the fact that I have more women in senior positions than any governor before me. The lack of diversity on the state police detail was an ongoing disappointment for me. In many ways, the governor's detail is the face of state government that people see. When I attend an event, people see the detail that's with me. I was continuously trying to recruit more to diversify. On one occasion, I met two female troopers who were